this is your Tech News Briefing for Monday, August 22nd. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. As you may know, the crypto platform Ethereum is a ledger technology that lets users build applications on top of its blockchain. It's like an operating system for a computer, except instead of being run by Apple or Microsoft, it's decentralized, run by many computers that verify and process transactions. Now, the nonprofit that runs Ethereum is preparing for a major change to how it operates. It's being called the Ethereum Merge, and it's got people in crypto land very excited. Joining us to discuss what's behind all this excitement and what the change is in the first place is our cryptocurrency reporter, Paul Vigna. Hey, Paul. Thanks for coming back on the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. So, Paul, start us off with why Ethereum is doing this merge. So Ethereum is doing this merge, which is basically a software upgrade. And the software upgrade is going to change the way the network operates. And the design is to make it less environmentally hazardous, to cut down on how much energy it takes to run the network. Networks like Ethereum and Bitcoin and most of the, all of these other cryptocurrencies really are open networks. Anybody can download the software, log their computer on, and, and act as an operator on the network. And what Bitcoin and Ethereum do right now is they have these systems and they're called proof of work. But like I said, running all that computing power is extremely environmentally hazardous. It just uses up a lot of energy. So Ethereum is putting in a system called proof of stake. And rather than forcing people to use computing power and thus energy, you're just you're putting up money. You're just you're staking a certain amount of money to be a validator on the network and be one of the operators. They think it'll, you know, might lower Ethereum's energy costs and usage by 99%, which is great. I mean, it's a big deal. So they're making this switch kind of from one method of doing things to another, and it should have these environmental benefits. But I'm wondering if there are any other benefits that uh, Ethereum might get out of doing this change. Hopefully what it will also do is it will speed up the processing of transactions on the network, which will reduce bottlenecks. There are a lot of bottlenecks where sometimes transactions all get, there are just too many transactions the network can handle, and you end up, it's like traffic on, you know, Route 3 in the morning going into the city. (laughs) Uh, You just, everybody can't get through the Lincoln Tunnel at the same time. So hopefully it'll reduce bottlenecks, and that will lower the costs to people actually on the network. Uh, There's a way that the, you know, you pay a fee and the fee is supposed to be small per transaction. But when you get these bottlenecks, the fees are, they they sort of recalibrate so that whoever pays more can get their car through the tunnel faster. So the fees can jump up. I mean, you know, earlier this year, it jumped up to $200 per transaction, which is just insane. You can't run a network on that. You know, in in your recent newsletter, you mentioned that while this merge with Ethereum might be good for environmental purposes, it actually doesn't solve some of the other problems that Ethereum has because of its goals. Can you explain that a little bit? I mean, why won't it be better? Well, what it won't do, and what in my mind is still to this day Ethereum's biggest problem, is that it is just too difficult for the average person to take the time to educate themselves about Ethereum, download the software, run it, figure out how it's supposed to be run, get a wallet, learn how to secure it. I mean, the, you know, the stories of people who have lost their money because they just didn't understand the, the security requirements alone are legion. Like there, there's no deposit insurance, you know, you're not opening a savings account where the bank is ultimately responsible for it. And if the bank fails, the FDIC steps in and makes you whole. You are responsible for it. There's just a lot of steps to being on Ethereum that most people are just not going to take. So in the in the lead up to this merge, what has been going on with Ethereum? How have investors and people who use it been reacting? They've been reacting very, very positively. <laughs> you know, the last uh, since late June, when cryptocurrencies all sort of bottomed out. Since late June, the price of Ethereum 
at one point it had doubled. It was trading under $1,000 in late June, and it got up to almost $2,000 about a week ago. And most of that was just people getting excited about this merge finally going in because they've been talking about this and building it for years. And it's gone through a series of delays and there was never a firm date and they never knew what it was really going to happen or if it was going to happen. And I suppose you could still have a situation where they have to delay it again, but they've kind of put in a a relatively firm date of about September 15th for this to go in. So over the last month or so, people have been getting excited that this is finally going to happen and traders have used that you know, as a spark for buying Ether and driving up the price. And at one point, like I said, it was up you know, more than 100%. I wonder if this kind of lead up to the merger, if this moment that Ether is having where it's saying we're going to focus on kind of what we do and what our purpose is, it represents any kind of shift in how people are going to think about cryptocurrency more broadly and, and what its purpose is, particularly given the, the lower values of some other tokens. I don't think so. I think it's a good question to raise, but I don't think so. I mean, the the merge in and of itself is not going to be the thing that changes all of the cryptocurrency market's fortunes. You know, all of the really, really big issues are still there. The regulatory uncertainty, the lack of security, you know, really in the crypto markets, if you look around, there's almost a hack a week. The structure of The markets, what we've seen this year is that these things crash hard and there are no backstops. And the lack of any sort of compelling use case is still a big issue. There still isn't much that you can do with cryptocurrencies besides trade them. And that's fine for a lot of people and that's interesting for a lot of people and people love making money, so that works. But at some point, you have to come up with a very utilitarian reason for people to be interested in this and to want to use it. All right. So still a lot of things to consider in this market. And for people who want to keep up with all things crypto, they can sign up for your weekly WSJ crypto newsletter. That's at WSJ.com. All right. That's our cryptocurrency reporter, Paul Vigna. Paul, thanks again for joining us. Yep. Thanks for having me on. And that's it for today's tech news briefing. If you're a fan of our show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.